you. We got Agreed. you. Okay, happy days. Happy days. <laughs> we did it. Woo. Well, I, I ended up uh, in LA working with quite a lot of big names, like, you know, training them for movies. But it's, it's you know what? They're, they're more messed up than we are. Yeah, <laughs> but exactly. That's <laughs> <laughs> too bad. Yeah, I think the more driven people are as well, that yeah. sometimes, that there's, sometimes they're driven for a reason and it's not normally a good, sometimes not normally a good reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, it, it's an it's like a distraction yeah. hiding from the past. You know, so just yeah. more and more success. But you're never going to hide from your demons. You have to face them. Totally, buddy. You know, just... Thanks so much for that, Paul. What if what if I can legend uh, Harley is? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's really helpful. Yeah, nice guy. Uh, how fourteen technically you can be against fifty six? <laughs> yeah. So thanks very much. I just want to thank you thank guys. You. Okay. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's really nice. To t- I feel like I've had a bit of therapy this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, me too. It yeah, was a good well. listening, man. Really Thank you cool, so man. much. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. See you later, Craig. See you, Gareth. Take Bye. care, buddy. See you, See you mate. Later, man. Cheers, Bye. Paul. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> How's it going, Gareth? Hey, Craig. Ask good things to you, buddy. Uh, brilliant my man good to see you welcome home man yeah bud thanks man and you too uh, unfortunately i'm seeing your face over skype and not in person which is a bit of a shame this week but we still had a great time eh? oh we had an amazing time man. and uh yeah time to get into this amazing chat that we had as well hey yeah for sure we have a very uh, important and great guest paul connolly to introduce uh, paul is the seventh son of a seventh son and in the Irish culture, that is a, a lucky charm. Paul was an abandoned child from two weeks old. And pretty much for most of his life, he was the victim of child abuse. He ended up becoming a gangster. And after that, he turned his life around to become a fitness expert and celebrity trainer. And these days, he's an author, a public speaker, and most importantly, he's a dad and loving husband. Yeah, and we got into lots of deep topics, um, abandonment and the fact that Paul was abandoned as a baby. And ultimately, that led to him leading his youth in the notorious St. Leonard's Children's Home. Uh, ultimately, he also discusses some really tough topics about mental and physical abuse that happened there. And to himself and to other kids, it's really tough, but, you know, uh, really important chat, um, an important topic. Uh, we also discussed the deep friendships that are forged in exquisitely difficult situations and also the mentors that sort of uh, pop up in one's life in the unlikeliest of places and ultimately in the unlikeliest of people. Uh, we also explore the darker side of Paul's life when he got into gangsterism and regret and revenge are associated with with that scenario. Um, And ultimately, we also get on to Paul's new beginnings and how he deals with uh, actually uh, revenge in the best of ways. Yeah, for sure. And just in terms of a bit of housekeeping this week, uh, we were obviously together all all of last week in the usa and it was so awesome to just sort of reconnect uh, in person hey craig yes it was amazing man we uh, we just met some amazing people you and i had the best time just seeing each other it's been way too long uh, and it was so good actually to catch up better than we had anticipated and we got a lot done but more importantly we just hung out as buddies and like got to just, um, you know, do all the stuff that buddies do, just hang out, shoot the breeze and uh, explore a city together. Yeah, it was awesome. And we managed to make a few changes and do a bit of an audit, I guess, in terms of uh, our podcast. And we're hopefully going to bring you some exciting new stuff coming forward. Uh, We also met some like amazing people at the conference and they really have sort of helped shape us as like I guess people and uh, given us new ideas 
uh, to carry on forward. Um, I just had such a great time with all those people, hey, Craig, all those networking events and stuff. Yeah, this is so good. And and you know what? It's that's what they all are, these kind of things are about. It's just the people, isn't it? And uh, it just once again reminded us of how important the human connection is. And I just you know we just like just had such a great time, but also had some really meaningful times, like you said, like actually reflecting on ourselves and on the podcast and uh and and i'm so grateful for that because it it just pushed us in the right direction and you know we just wanted to give everyone a great shout out because um you know it just meant so much to us that the the the, um the conversations that we had with the people there really have made us take a positive leap forward i reckon yeah absolutely i don't think we actually sort of understood like what a big impact it would have on us um but it certainly has yeah, and also just another thing, just in terms of the actual chat, uh, there's a lot of uh, colorful language and expletives um, in this conversation, just to give people a, a bit of a warning. Um, and yeah, just uh, something that we noticed when we were in America was the amount of um, homeless people uh, on the streets in New York and Philadelphia. And it kind of makes you wonder, like, I guess you know, what happened to them for them to get into those situations? And also, you know, what do their children think? Or do they even have children? And how did everything just get to the state it did for those people? Yes. Yeah, totally. And and if, and if they are the children of someone else, like, what do they think? How did it get to that point as well? It's just really horrible to see the some of the discrepancies and some of the mental illnesses that are apparent, quite apparent on the streets um, uh, that we noticed. Um, and, you know, this this week's guest, uh, Paul Conley, he really sort of helps us understand what a worst case scenario is is possible, what is possible out there. It's, it's really tough, you know, and, and kids that are, you know, left alone, they, they end up in these horrible places sometimes. And, you know, we, we are so grateful to have good homes and, and some of these uh, people out there just live totally different lives, totally removed from we even what what we would consider even humanly possible, uh, and you know it just it's just amazing to to even think about what is happening behind some closed doors. Hey, yeah, totally. And like I guess you know to go into the specifics, uh, there Paul talks a lot about the child abuse in the care system in the UK, and how the authorities literally turn a blind eye to it. And when you hear his story, it's actually really disgraceful and disgusting how people can do what these kids, what do what they did to these kids. And that these people are actually still roaming free. And also some of them, for everything that they did, they will never be identified and called out. And it's just... It's such a sad and horrible situation. Yeah, for sure. That's, uh, you know, one of the guys got 14 years uh, for like untold number of horrible things. And, and 14 years is just not very long. And one of the other people that were involved, a convicted pedophile, is actually, um, you know, running another children's home. It's like you just can't even believe that this is possible. And, you know, it, that's just one of the sort of more political sides of it. But um, this story is actually, if there's ever been an important story to tell, it's this one, you know, that yeah, our, our children are, the, you know, the most important thing and they need to be cared for. And unfortunately, kids do, they are abandoned. And, you know, that's, it's something that needs to be brought to our attention of how do we help? How do we contribute to um, to the to that uh, plight of of kids that are left alone, and uh, at least Paul is um, you're sh- shining a bit of a light on that whole scenario with his books and ultimately now a movie. Yeah, for sure. And there was a part in his story where everything could have turned out quite differently. Uh, Paul was <clears throat> seeking revenge on one of these people, and he had a plan uh, to basically kill this person. But uh, that never actually happened. And in a way, I think it's probably the most best thing that happened because he could have been in jail and sort of had no platform to speak from. But now he does. And he has the opportunity to save so many more kids than he would have been able to do from a jail cell. 
and he's definitely doing that in every possible way that he can hey craig for sure this is the um the sort of the the greatest good in the world is to to give revenge like the way he's doing it you know it's just actually contributing back and it's in the it flies in the face of these people is the easiest way out would have like you said would have been just to take them out and he actually decided against that and is now actually creating a real positive in, influence in the world and and that's an amazing form of revenge isn't it and i think this is a good point and a good place to take a look and see what makes paul conley ridiculously human well, good morning there, um, Paul Connolly from a really hot UK. I guess you're in Essex. How's it going today, my man? Really good, thanks. Really good, Gareth. Yeah, very warm here. Very warm. Yeah. But uh, it's beautiful, beautiful out there. Ah, cool stuff, man. Well, thanks for joining us so much on uh, the Ridiculously Human podcast. Um, it's uh, great to see your face, and uh, we're really excited to chat to you today. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. It's, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. But yeah, so yeah. How, how's things going anyway? We know, like you kind of like to have a few cups of tea in the morning before you get going. <laughs> yeah, I've just uh, I've got my nice cup of cup of English tea here, ready to go. Ready to go. <laughs> that's cool, yeah. man. And you had an event last night, eh? You went and did a talk somewhere. Yeah, I I, was, I, I work for a couple of charities over here, uh, uh, Beanstalk, which is a child literacy charity in london and uh a child uh, a charity called kids inspire yeah that they deal with the worst abused kids in essex so uh yeah we've been doing some stuff behind the scenes for them and uh they, they they're um this is them they're on the back of my new book that's their logo oh wow cool oh, wow. Picture. Yeah. wow yeah some of the kids they deal with are you know i love these people because they they work six days a week and only get paid for three wow. days a week they're really genuine people so they've got the my movie and my book is that there's some donations going from both the movie and the book to this charity because they're literally uh you know always constantly looking for money and and support wow. so yeah wow so what is they what do they actually do they kids come um, to them that have yeah the worst the worst abused kids in essex i mean uh two an example is two young girls aged two and five recently that they've dealt with where they were sleeping under a car outside the front of their parents' house, uh, their mother's house, because the mum was running it as a brothel. What? You know, and, yeah, and uh, a young lad, three years old, saw his father being, uh, his father hack his mother to death, and, you know. No ways. Yeah, the young, vulnerable children that are in just, you know, any, they used to have to have a license to have a dog, to let anyone have a kid when I, you know, it's just one of those things, unfortunately. It's, oh, uh, man. It's terrible, but these char- this charity is amazing. What they do, absolutely amazing, because they they come from his uh, his uh, her holistic background. The, the lady who runs it, so they do a lot of spiritual stuff with the kids as well as the therapies, and they work with the parents as well so when they can. So it's a brilliant charity. Wow. And uh, wow. yeah, my new book and my movie coming out. We we're back in them. We're back in them financially, and we're also like raising awareness because. They're only a small charity in Essex, and they're struggling. But uh, we're going to get behind them. So, yeah. well, that's awesome. This is, so yeah, this so, is obviously know. something that's like really common, I guess. You know. Yeah, I mean, it, there's so many different types of charities. I, I raised a couple of hundred grand for Beanstalk a year, yeah. year or so ago. I did a speech in the House of Lords, and I was following Boris Johnson. He had them all laughing. I got them, had them all crying. And then uh, Lord Archer got up. And Lord Archer got up as the auctioneer and fleeced them all for their money. So we got two hundred grand. <laughs> wow, well done. Oh, good so, job, man. Yeah. That's amazing. You got to make these rich bankers feel guilty, you know. Yeah, <laughs> <That's> true, <man. laughs> yeah was a, why not? It was the last ever sketch of Margaret Thatcher, which went for a hundred grand. Wow. The drawing, wow. just just the drawing, you know. Wow. There's a hundred. They get bidding and bidding. We're like, really? Wow. Jeepers, that's crazy. Eh? It's amazing what people will buy as memorabilia. 50 pence to some merchant banker, though. You know, yeah, that's yeah. like that's a couple of quid to them. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's a different world. My mentor is a, he's a billionaire speaker, philanthropist. I can't say that word. <laughs> philanthropist. <laughs> that's the one. He's, he's been mentoring me on the speaking circuit, Jake, and he gives a million pounds a year away to, to Chicago Opera House. No it's ways. a different world. Different wow, world, man. isn't it? Wow, yeah. Yeah. Who is that, bud? Sorry, Jake. Who? 
I can't say his surname because okay. he likes to okay. say uh, he likes to be anonymous. But he's been at every speech I've ever done, and he, the first speech I did, I got quite emotional. I was in the mayor's office, and uh, my mate said, "Oh, you know what? It's just going to be a few sandwiches and like a few lawyers and a couple of snotty people. Just go and give it to him." I walked in there, silver service, <laughs> some bird with a harp, Lord and Lady this. Whoa. Right, and, and I'm the keynote speaker. Wow. So I'm getting, Jeez. so I'm getting up and I'm speaking about my mate Liam who jumped on the railway tracks in in front of in Elephant Castle, committed suicide at my movie Six from Eight. Obviously, what? six of the boys committed suicide. And I his first speech we ever did, I, I started getting emotional, I started crying. I was like, oh shit, this ain't really on. So uh, they all come up and said, oh, it's brilliant, it's brilliant. This guy Jake come up and said, you shouldn't get emotional when your speech is like that. He said, it's unprofessional. And I went. God, who do you think he is? And he got up and gave a speech. He was brilliant. So when I did the house, when I did the house of Lords, he went, "Oh, you're a bit better." And he's been mentoring me all the way through. And this guy's, wow. a, yeah, and he's really, really helped me. But uh, you wouldn't know he's a billionaire, this fella. You wouldn't know it. But he likes to be anonymous. Crazy. And, and he's and he's an amazing speaker himself, and and he does a fair amount of um, speaking engagements. Yeah, he does. Yeah, and he's he's mentored me on the speaking circuit because I was awful. I was absolutely awful. I would be past all my notes and I was terrible. But every time I've done one, he's, when I did the last one at the Mayfair Hotel, he'd come up and gave me a brand. He went, you're not a frightened little boy now. No one's trying to fuck you up the arse. Come on, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so he's a straight so he's talker a, he, as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think you need that. If you're the sort of person I am, I don't want people blowing smoke up my ass. I want people to tell me when I'm shit, you know, and, and, and you're not going to get any better if people keep saying, oh, you're an amazing speaker when you're not. So, and I'm not, I'm not great. I'm not the finished article. It's, I prefer to do this kind of thing, which is bouncing off each other, like getting up and going cold. Yeah. That's hard, you know. That's yeah. a big skill, isn't it? Jeez. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not easy. I think, I think everyone is, well, I'm not everyone, of course, but like most people, they're petrified of talking. You know, it's just it's one of those yeah. things as well. You get better. You get easy, it gets easier. You know, it does get easier. It's, in my audience is normally just wealthy people, and they and they it's their world is not my world. So when I say to them about, I tell them my story. Yeah. And I say like my mentors were gangsters. Yeah. So, my boxing coaches who saved my life, they were gangsters. So they fed me, they protected me. So what did I become? I became a gangster. That was they were my mentors. If these posh bankers were my mentors, I probably would have been a posh banker. Yeah. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> uh, Maybe a banker. <laughs> yeah, a bit of a merchant banker, that's about it. <laughs> oh, that's classic. So I guess talking a bit about bankers, I actually have to thank a, a banking mate of mine uh, uh, that I used to work with, uh, Lee Glassick. And um, he... Yeah. Lee, actually, I was chatting to him during the week, uh, last week, and he's like, oh, my word, you've got to chat to a, you know, a, a friend of mine, Paul, uh, that I kind of grew up with. Or, or I, I don't know the exact, the, the exact history with you guys, but he was just like, you, you, you really should speak to this guy. And he sent me like, a couple of videos, and um, you know, straight away I was like, definitely have to. And then you, know, you were just so kind and like, cool on, on LinkedIn, just getting back to me saying, yeah, for sure, let's chat to it. So... We have a we yeah. have a banker to thank for sort of setting That's us all right. up and getting it going. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So d just about like you did you grow up with Lee or what was the background there? His uh, I I bought boxing circuits to London back in the late eighties, early nineties. Box aerobics, box size. I was working out in the states, and because I had a boxing background and a fitness background, I was ideally placed to come back to London and make a few quid. Yeah. So I was the I was the first box aerobics, boxer size coach in the UK and the first one, wow. one of the first personal trainers back in the late 80s as well. Wow. And I come back from the States and I just smashed it. I was earning really good money. I was the first one to say I'm taking 50% of all the doors in the West End and the East End. And I, I had classes throughout the West End, East End, City, Essex, everywhere. And uh, yeah, it, it was one of those, his sister, Lisa, is older than him and she was in one of my venues as one of the uh, receptionists. Because uh -huh. she was she was a young girl. I used to, I used to wind her up, you know, have a little bit of a laugh. <laughs> and I saw, and I saw her recently, and I went, "Oh, we used to have a laugh, didn't we?" And she went, yeah, "You mean you used to have a laugh?" <laughs> <laughs> and she said, but she said, "I had the last laugh, though, Paul." And I went, "Why is that?" Now she's in her forties now. I said, "Why is that?" She went, "All those cups of tea I made you, I spat in it." I spat in it. <laughs> I 
was like, it's oh, good for your immune system anyway, Lisa. She, uh, so she, she said, I had the last laugh. So I used to wind her up because she was a young girl. And just, all, all the lads used to come in all muscles to do my classes. And I'm going, oh, look at him. She's going, shut up, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, I go, Lisa. I used to say, Lisa fancies you. And uh, she used to go, and she'd go, here's your cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. Well, the cool thing is if if she thick as half, is it, if her skin is half as thick as Lee's, then then that's just sort of like water off a duck's back. You know what I mean? Oh, so, <laughs> yeah. No, it was all good. It was of all course. good. You know, it's all a, just a laugh. You know, but yeah. just a bit. You know, a bit of uh, black humour. It's all. It's, the thing is, it's a long old day, isn't it? You got to have a laugh. Totally, yeah, but it's totally. so important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, gets you through the day, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so it's important to laugh yeah, about ourselves. Your, your, your long days. What, how does a typical day go for you? What do you get up to in your? At the moment, yeah. well, recently I, I was doing 80, 90 hour weeks because we're filming the movie Six wow. from Eight with Michael Socher and uh, uh, Zoe Tapper, and not, it's, it's amazing. We've done a short movie a year or so ago. This is the feature film, so we're we're shooting that, and I'm writing that with the directors and the, and uh, the writers. At the same time, I'm writing this with mm. the ghostwriter. This, the ghostwriter did Jade Goody's deathbed book, and she said to me, I read Against All Odds, Paul, and you left a lot out. So she was digging. So, you know, she got wow. me to she got me to like go back to the rape squads coming up the fire escapes, trying to rape us, and then I used to sleep with a knife uh, with a wooden handle thing. So she basically dug – so I was doing the book – the movie, my 60 hours a week in my own studio, my physio and my personal training, and I do a lot of, uh, I work with kids with scoliosis and lumbosis, all different, like, I won't bore you with that. So I was doing 60 hours there, doing the book and the movie, and at the same time, I was a keynote, I'm a, what's known as a core participant in the, uh, in, in the um, child sexual abuse, historical child sexual abuse government inquiry now. So I'm having to go up, lonely giving evidence in that. So... I was almost like, felt like I was having a breakdown, you know, it was just too much. Now I'm cruising, mm. you know, now the book's done, the movie's done, you know, I'm, and I'm just back to like a normal 60, 70 hour week. I'm, I'm cruising. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> the thing is, all these things come at once and you just got to, you got to manage it, you know, mm. just got to manage it. Um, so, but I love my, I love the day job because, you know, I'm the, I'll bore you with this, but I'm the seventh son of the seventh son in an Irish Catholic family, they believe that I can heal, that I'm charmed and that I'm lucky. So mm. when I was in my early 20s, I was I was running around London with a branding stuck down the back of my trousers, like shooting people and killing it. Like li literally, I was a horrible, I don't know how much I can say. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I was, wasn't was a nice guy. I've swerved 10, 10 year prison sentence, sentences twice now, um, just pure, through luck more than judgment. And people used to say to me, you're the luckiest guy I've ever known. But I've been shot, stabbed, I've fallen off a roof. I've had my arm almost severed off. I had my hand cut in half. Wow. I've, been, I've been bitten. I, I had a shotgun blast at me, buckshot on the, one of the doors one night. And people used to say to me, like, I was run over three times as a kid. I mean, it goes on and on and on. I nearly died <laughs> when I was 49. I had a septus. And they, the kids and my, my wife come up to say, do the priest the last rites. So... I, I've lost count of the amount of times I've nearly died, and, pe and, and uh, people used to say to me like, "Like, you're, how are you getting away with this all the time?" Like, I'm 56 now, but because I'm the seventh son of the seventh son, you can't have any girls in between. So my dad was one of 14. What? Yeah, Irish Catholics, they just bang Jeez. them out, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no condoms for you, mate. <laughs> no, no. But I'm one of I'm one of eight, so. I'm the seventh boy, and my dad was the seventh boy, but you can't have any girls in between. Twice when I was in my 20s, and I was a very, I was a very violent man, I'd had people come, a little, a little Irish fella come up to me on the train once, and he went, you're the chosen one. I went, what? You're the chosen one. He went, and I was with two horrible, horrible geezers, and they started laughing, and I went, <laughs> You're the seventh son of the seventh son. And I just went cold. As this geezer knows, a stranger wow. on a train. Wow. And he said to me, you listen to me, son. He said, mark my words, one day you're going to be a great healer. Wow. Right, so yeah, 56 now. I've got waiting lists. I've got people coming all over the world to see me for scoliosis, lumbos, for back conditions. I just, most of it's instinctive. Some of it's obviously conventional. And, I, and you wouldn't, what I'm doing, with, I'm healing people every day. 
And it's just, and the reward is phenomenal, you know. I've stopped nine operations now for kids with back conditions, all operations cancelled, all good posture, all out of pain, because I've got the specialist conditioning background and I'm treating with like sports massage and like trigger point, monofascia, and it's just really working. And it's just, yeah. you know, it's just really weird it's, that this was predicted by strangers. Wow. And, That's and incredible, it, bud. Yeah, and all this geezer could see was, Three horrible. I was with two black geezers, and we were we were tooled up. We were on a tube in London, and we were going to do a, do something very naughty. And this geezer come up to me and said that we were going off. How did you feel? So so now this guy comes up to you, and obviously you're in this frame of mind of like we're going to go do a job now, or whatever it is. How did like what happened internally, or did you did you fob it off, or was it like I, I fobbed it off at the time because they were all laughing, going, oh. but they but I knew I was the seventh son of the seventh son. They didn't know that. They just thought it was funny. But it, inside, I was like, this is strange, really mm. strange. See, I, it's, I need to clarify what I just said, though. Like, I'm not a violent person. This is going to sound weird. I'm not, <laughs> a violent, I'm not a violent person. I became violent because I had to, yeah. because I was battered and, and every day from as long as I can remember. From as young, what, Go back to whatever your distant memory is. I don't know, two, three, four, five. I can remember being alone, having no one having my back. This is me, all of my own. And that makes you angry anyway. But then on top of that, if you're constantly frightened from the age of like six or seven till you're like 17, 18, 10 years of being bullied at school, being battered by my carers, being battered by bigger kids in the, in the homes, constantly walking around terrified, you finally become sick of being frightened. So then when you start making other people frightened, it becomes, it's almost very empowering. Yeah. But it's wrong. I'm not trying to justify what I've done, but I, I, I turned into a monster. But that's not who I was. That's not who I really was. That's what I turned into. And I think I've come out the other side. I mean, I've been violent free now since 2000. It's all about, my son laughs at me. He said, Dad, you sound like an alcoholic. Like, I haven't had a drink since 2000. <laughs> you haven't clumped anyone since 2000, Dad. I went, nah, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> I'm like, but, trust but, me, I've, I've wanted to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but so, just, I think, yeah. Yeah, okay, here you go, go, Craig. I was just going to say, look, there's so much there already to unpack, uh, Paul. Um, if we could just, like, take a bit of somewhat of a chronological yeah. Like step back and, and take us right back to your yeah. earliest memory and before and, and just sort of work your way forward so that our listeners just get this understanding of, of what makes the man. But, so yeah. so to, just, just to interrupt there, sorry, um, even before the earliest memory, though, if you can just explain, like, you know, what actually happened to you, I guess, you know, yeah. when you were two weeks old. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is me, right? I go off on a tangent, so pull me back, right, because I will go all over the place. So just stop me because I, 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 I've got verbal Tourette's or whatever it is, right? <laughs> so two weeks old. So I'm the, I'm the eighth child born. So all my family born in Galway, in, uh, well, Kilkira and Connemara. It's a couple of hours down the coast. Beautiful, beautiful place. My dad's buried there now. See, I'm going off again. I won't go off. Right? So, <laughs> He's a storyteller. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm the only one born in East London. I'm the, all my... My, like my, my kids go, Dad, you're not Irish. Look, listen to you. You're fucking cockney. <laughs> but if I, like, all my brothers got Irish accents, right? So, <laughs> and so did my parents. So, um, so I was born in Queen Mary's Hospital, Stratford, East London, and I was the eighth child. And my mum put me out with the rubbish at two weeks old. I don't know what was going on with her. She, she was an Irish midwife, apparently. I only met her twice when I was a very young kid. And she, I, I just get this impression she was having kids and just giving them away everywhere. I think she could deliver them herself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I was taken into the, uh, all my siblings have came up through the care system, by the way, not just me, at one stage or another. Um, real blight on London Borough Tower Emlets, to be quite honest with you. Like, I mean, this is back in the day when if you were in London and, and you were guest houses, you used to have big signs on the, roof, on the window saying, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. What? Like, yeah, so oh. we, were, we were considered the lowest form of life, the Irish. Hmm. Yeah, because, like, we, 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 you know, 
so this was this was quite common back in the sixties. Well, the Irish were rebuilding London at the time. Yeah. Like you know, um, so the social I was taken in by social services. The first children's home I went to was a children's home called St Vincent's in Mill Hill in Hendon in London, and it was run by nuns and nurses. And it was my earliest memory was two weeks old, so obviously I don't remember that. Um, when you leave the care system, you can read your files, and I went and read all my files, so I sort of got some background from that. But um, that was all right. It was nuns. I met this lady there, Mary. She yeah. was my nurse. She was my nurse, so she wanted to adopt me, but she was only 17 at the time, huh. and she couldn't uh -huh. because she was too young and because even though my mum didn't want me, she wouldn't sign the papers. I don't know. I can't remember. But she spoke like the Queen. She's posh. Huh. Right? So she's really posh. And she used to take me down to the south coast, to the New Forest, and to all the beautiful bits um, of, like, the New Forest and Bournemouth and all the beautiful beaches when I was a kid. And that was, I remember those holidays because she'd take me out to children's home and she would take me down there. So that gave me, like, some good memories as a kid. But then when I got to seven, nearly eight, they moved me to St. Leonard's in, uh, in Hornchurch in Essex. St. Leonard's was a London Borough Tower Hamlet's children's home. So all the kids were from East London, which moved out to this idyllic, beautiful place in the country for them to get a better life. The kids that were abandoned, kids, kids like me, right? So unfortunately, it got built up, and it's, it's more like suburbia now. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're talking about 1970, and it's all right. It's okay. We're, talk, we're talking about 1970. I was coming up for my eighth birthday. There was 300 kids in this children's home. It's massive. And uh, it was run by a paedophile ring. Nice. This children's home. These, there was no vetting back in the 70s. So all the people, that, not that's wrong, not all the people that worked in care were paedophiles, but a lot of them were. Well, so um, you think about 1970, there's no checks done. There should have been, but there's no checks done. Uh, you're right, kid. So, um, yeah, so uh, where was I? My no, house father, no. Bill Starling, was, sorry, my, my house father, Bill Starling, was a lorry driver. My house mother, I can't mention her name for legal reasons, right, was uh, a cleaner. So they were in charge of looking after me and 30 other kids. So the first day I went there, most kids wet the bed when children, because they're insecure, so they wet the bed in children's homes. So... My house mother dragged me out of bed in the morning, threw me in a bleach, cold bleach bath with the sheets and all the and all the wet all the wet stuff and scrubbed me till I bleed. And she was like, "This is what you do to little fuckers who piss the bed here." And that was my introduction to my hat, the woman who was going to look after me for the next ten years, my mother figure. <laughs> what? Jesus. And she used to say to me, "You're not normal." Hence. Wow. Okay. Uh. And she used to say, "You're not normal." Because if you were normal, you'd have a loving parent. You'd be with a family. You'd be looked after. Nobody wants you. You're not normal. You're Irish. Like You're going to end up in prison like all your brothers. You're going to end up dead or in prison by the time you're 30. Now, the funny thing is, most of the people that predicted that for me are in prison. <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> wow. And I'm not. Um, <laughs> so, as, so for the next 10 years, there was a lot. She did a lot of mental torture on me. Like She just mentally abused me. Do you need me, kid, or are you just sitting there? Okay, so my kids come in. I don't like to talk about these things in front of him. You've read the books. You watch the movie. <laughs> so for the next ten years, she did a lot of mental abuse on me. Like you know, my self-esteem was on the toilet. But lucky enough, lucky enough for me, when I went there, I was nearly eight, and I'd had some good experiences. So I had some self-esteem when I went there. But obviously, they were, and I was quite defiant, and they didn't like that. There's a scene in the movie where. I've got a I've got a burn hole in my chest here. This is a cigarette burn. You might not be able to see yeah, it. Yeah, wow. yeah. So that's a where Bill Stalin, my he my house father, decided that he was going to teach me a lesson because I was defiant. So he they used to get us all up and put us in all the hallways and strip us off naked and walk behind, take their legs out with bats and things, just anything to amuse themselves when they got back from the pub. And I was the one. That, like they used to tell me to batter other kids. You used to have this thing about you batter that kid for us. And I used to say, no, I ain't battering no one for you. 
right? And then you're only eight, right? So he came up to me and I used to smoke a lot. But, and he's, we're all naked and he stubbed his cigarette out into my chest. This is a scene in the movie, funny enough. And they battered me and then he pissed all over me. What? Jesus. Yeah, because obviously... So this scene in the movie, our first kid actor, his parents said he's not doing that. So we had to get another kid actor because the parents said he'd be damaged for life. Obviously, it's a movie scene. They wasn't actually going to do that to him. Yeah. But Jeez. so all the kids on our movie had to have counsellors. And, we, you know, it's been quite tough on them. But we got some amazing kid actors, like really phenomenal, just like the abuse scenes. Really powerful. Now, this is I've never seen a movie like this. The closest I've seen to it is Sleepers. Uh, yeah. And I don't know if you know Sleepers, eight, 1980s movie. Uh, Brad Pitt. But the moral of that story was, see, I've gone off again, but I'm going to go back in a minute. The moral, <laughs> the moral of that story was they didn't learn, right? So they got away with shooting and killing their abusers, but they still, be, they were still gangsters. So they ended up dying and in prison anyway. So you have to learn. Yeah? As mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali would say, show me a man in his 50s that still thinks the same way as he does in his 20s, and I'll show you a wasted life. Huh. Right? So, so you have to change. You have to evolve. You have to, you have to know who you really are. But let's go back because I'm off again, right? So, uh, so for the next ten years, eleven years, that like, I got the physical beatings from Bill Stalin, the mental talk, mental torture from his wife, who I can't mention. Uh, she's called Auntie Coral in the book, and there was only three or four sexual attempts on me. That about the third night I was there, one, I, the kids started getting antsy in the dormitory. There was twelve kids. No. 10 kids in the dormitory that night and they started getting antsy, started crying and hiding. I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? No one told me, right? There was used to be a brick fire escape up the side of the dormitory. What, what they would do is they'd go out and get pissed, then come back and rape the kids, right? Come up the fire escape. What? They used to have a rape squad. Not just people that worked there, people they used to bring back from the pub and the ones that didn't want to get identified would have balaclavas on. What? Yeah, so this, so... What happened this particular night, I think it was like the third night I was at this children's home. I just, it was my, I'll tell you how I remember it, it was my eighth birthday. I was eight, it was my birthday, right? So, uh, not that it, that mattered in that place, to be fair. So what happened was the door burst open and kids are running around screaming. And it was back in the days we had all those stripy pyjamas. And I'm like, fucking, what's going on here? I had no idea, right? So this guy picks me up and grabs me and starts to drag me out the dormitory. And I just like fucking bit his arm, struggled free and then run off. I got under the bed, picked up another kid and they run off, right? They took these kids off down to the staff dormitories and they raped them all. And these kids come back with all bleeding pajamas and shit, right? So I'm like, what the fuck goes on here? So the, next so the next day, I'm thinking they're gonna rape me. They're gonna rape, I'm gonna be raped, right? I, I got away with it last night, but I'm gonna be raped, right? So then I, I thought, I've got to do something. When they all went to bed, I sneaked down into the kitchens and I went into the, uh, there's this big uh, pantry place and they lock all the knives up. They locked them all up, couldn't get a knife. I thought, I need a knife, I need a knife, I need something. Anyway, I went into the pantry and I broke the door in the pantry and I found a knife, a, a wood hand knife sitting in a lump of cheese grabbed that fucking thought I broke in I and I know someone's broke in anyway then I literally that was my teddy bear for the rest of my life I slept with that like, and stuck there all the time so when they came when the rape squads came I would get under the bed and anyone tried to get under the bed anyone lifted the bed I would just be swiping the knife kids adults anyone come near me they get stabbed they get stabbed and there's a scene in the movie where that happens. And there was a couple of other attempts. But I think if I'd have got buggered, I don't, I don't think I'd be here. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I don't know. So out of the dormitory, out of, the movie's called Six from Eight. That's because six boys committed suicide out of the eight of us before they were 30. You know, my best friend Liam, he, uh, he jumped in front of the train on a elephant castle and, uh, you know the movie this book this book's dedicated to him to liam wow and that's all your first book yeah just yeah. for people listening yeah against all odds yeah it's dedicated to liam carroll if you can see that yeah yeah yeah, yeah.
That's so That's sad, great. buddy. Yeah, but we honor we honor Liam in the movie. There's a lot about Liam in the movie. He's, he's, there's a lot, you know. He's 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 not forgotten. He's tough. Uh, now, Liam was he was he someone that you were in the, these dorms with uh, through your that horrible journey or? No, Liam. Liam had a very different story. He had he was in he was one of five uh, kids in that care. Two of his brother Seamus. He's got two of his brothers. There's only two of them left alive. Seamus lives in Germany now, and I, and he's just written to me to thank me for you know the movie and for the books to remember to, mem- to remember Liam. Um, he had a tough time. He was buggered from as young as like three or four, Liam, and he didn't have a chance. Jesus, so- he was in a he was in a different unit to me, but we met because we used to go on the van together to the same Catholic school, and he protected me at school. What, what do you mean he protected you at school? Uh, I was like small and he used to look after me. Oh man. Yeah. And That's we went tough. to the we went to the boxing club together. Yeah. And, uh, he uh he was a good boxer, same as me. Like we we used to walk past Dagenham Boxing Club in East London because there's four miles from the, the children's home to the Catholic school. So the bus fare we used to be out because we because we used to bunk off school to go to school, so we needed to eat. So we needed to keep the bus fare to eat. We would get free dinner at the school, but we didn't go to the school because we were abused at the school as well. Right. So by the other kids and, and by the staff there, it was caned every day. So um, one day we was walking past Dagenham Boxing Club, and Liam said, "Let's go in there." And I said, "No, no, there's so men in there, you know." He said, well, if they try and fuck us, or we just run away. And we went in there, and it was the first proper male role models who were trying to beat us up or fuck us, and their wives fed us. I didn't even like boxing. I was a, I was a soft pussy kid, you know? But I won, I won most of the amateur titles because these men were trying to feed, like looking after me. They were, these wives were feeding me. They were, they were nice people, and we just, I just wanted them... You just you want to please them because they're they're looking yeah. after you. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. So um, they, my boxing coach Alan, uh, he saved my life because Starling gave me such a bad beating one day that I uh, I bunked off school and I came home and he waited behind the door for me and as I came through the door he punched me in the head and he used to have these wooden stairs. And he punched and kicked me all the way up wooden stairs and then kicked me down them. So I've broken ribs and, and stuff. And then they used to take us to the sick bay on site so there was no reports of the violence at the hospital. But I was so badly beaten that I, I had to get to the hospital. But they just left me. So I got on a bus with a towel around my head. And the towel was pissing blood. And they had no bus there. The, the conductor on the bus took pity on me and didn't, just got me to the hospital. But when I came out of the hospital, I was 13, 14 at the time. I got on the bus and I couldn't. They threw me off because I was stitched up. So I had to walk back to the children, to children's home, to get Liam, which was four or five miles, and then walk to the boxing club, which was four or five miles. And it was pissing down the rain, and Liam was just sharing his coat with me. And then when I got to the boxing club, I couldn't box because I was in a bad way. But I just wanted to be somewhere safe. Anyway, the there's a scene in the movie where, like, Kathy, his wife, um, finds me in a change room and, and it's like, and I'm in a bad way. And uh, Alan goes after Stalin, goes, because Alan was, I didn't know at the time, but they were gangsters. He went down there with his gun to get him. And uh, Stalin locked himself in a fireproof room. And Alan was shooting, shooting bullets at the, at the door and he was shitting himself. And he just told him, if he ever touched me again, he's going to come back and fucking kill him. And, they, and the beating stopped from that day. I stopped getting beaten. I stopped the beating, stopped. Because wow. cause, cause there were children that died in that children's home. They got beaten to, after death. And they literally was not the same people mentally, you know, because they just can't keep getting punches to the head all the time at such a young age. You know, like full-grown men punching young kids in the face and in the head all the time if it's, if it's repetitive. If it's 
if it's repetitive and it's constant, it just and like teachers used to come up and say, "Why is this kid in such a state?" And they used to say, "Well, he throws himself against a wall. He's a maniac. He's a violent child." What? So, Jesus. And we had what they called non-residential social workers that used to come 15 miles out of East London into Essex to see, and they were assigned to you. And they would sit in the room with Stalin and stay like, everything all right, Paul? You're not going to say no, are you? Because he's sitting there. They'd come twice a year. And there was no checks. And all. But they've covered, you know, London Borough of Tower Amulets has covered a lot up. I, I mean, I'm sort of going off the subject, but when I left there, I decided to get away from anyone who had anything to do with that children's home. So I, my, my, my thinking was, if I hang around with people that are like that, I'm just never going to get out of that mindset. You know, like a lot of people in care go back and work in the care system or they're, or they're, they're institutionalised or, they, mm. or, they, or they hang around with damaged people. Yeah. Because, so I, I decided that I would cut myself off from all that. So I went and, uh, I went and got myself a bed sit. And I was working in the building industry and I was, getting, I was working in gyms and I started to do door work. And uh, I just kept away from all that. But I was still a very violent man, you see, and I was still a very angry man. And, and I, I got to the point where I had a bit of a death wish. So if I got into a confrontation with someone, I was prepared to die. I wanted them to kill me. I wanted them to kill me because I, I needed to be, I didn't want to lie awake all night. I didn't want to, I didn't want all that. I just, you know, I wanted someone to put me out of my misery. And I used to seek out the most horriblest gangsters, the most violent people, and I would confront them. So then other gangsters that were right, really well connected would use me to do their bidding, you know? And I, and I used to enjoy hurting people, and I, you know, I looked them in the eye, and I knew they weren't ready to die, and I wanted to die. So I'd already won before the first punch was thrown, before anything. Because it's just, if you, if you have someone in that mindset, unless you're willing to go all the way, like they are, you're never going to win. And they knew that. Yeah. They knew that. And uh, I ain't proud of it. People say, oh, you know, I'm blind. I mean, you know, like, but then I started to get my, what's the word, self-esteem from people being frightened of me. Yeah. And Michael Socha, the, the actor who played me, he went, I've had the best time playing you at 35. I said, why is that? He said, all I've done is fuck women and beat people up. He said, it's been brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, no, no. But Paul, tell me now, like you, you're eight years old. Your, your, you know, people around you have been raped. You're getting beaten daily. You spoke about like sleep. How did you, like, how did you actually like sleep? And and were you in a constant state of fear? Or were there times? Did you have any happy memories there, or was it just literally like every day, just like fear, fear, fear? I I was frightened, twenty four seven for probably uh, eight, 16, uh, a good eight years. I was frightened of the other kids. The bigger kids that would beat you up, I was frightened of the staff that would beat you up or rape you or try to rape you. I was frightened of the teachers who used to cane me at school. I was frightened of the kids at school that used to pick on me because I was tiny and because I had, I had no people skills. I, I had I had nothing to offer. I was just a walking victim. I was just a pathetic individual, you know, that that anyone could take advantage of. And then one day, Bill Stalin decided to rape this girl in the girl's dormitory. And I walked past and I was, this was just after he was told in no uncertain times that he would die if he hit me. And I walked into this girl's dormitory and there was a girl there called Sarah Carr and there's a stunt driver here called Eddie Kidd who's who's a famous like uh, famous guy she married him actually she's beautiful this girl she was only about 13 14 he was trying to rape her and I walked into the dormitory and he told me to fuck off and I said I ain't going nowhere mate you ain't raping her and he was like you what you little cunt and I went I'm telling you anyway he he got so frustrated he tried to hit me, and we got into a bit of a scuffle. And they used to have these like mobile wardrobes, and he just punched me through them on the floor, and then threw them, pulled the wardrobe down on top of me. 
Right. And then that from that moment onwards, I stopped being frightened. Because she was, as I got up, she was crying and she was pulling her knickers on and she was thanking me and saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I was trying to hug her. And she was like, he, 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 he would have raped me and all that. And from that, um, that, I was empowered by that because I just thought, you know what? You ain't fucking doing this anymore. Mm. And I, I was about 14. And that, that was a switch for me. It just switched. I, just, I went from this frightened little kid to like, standing up for myself I was 14, 15 I was like no, fuck you and then every time somebody tried to hit me or or I thought I felt that I was threatened I would attack them first and I would attack them first and then I turned into because I obviously started picking up all the boxing skills and I was I was getting stronger and I was being fed we were getting food from because yeah. from the, from, they stole they stole most of the money for our food for our budget so we were literally starving all the time you know, Jeez. they stole it all, and they, we we didn't get fed at all. So I just I switched from this terrified little victim to this little this horrible little cunt I turned into, and I just wanted I just wanted I wanted to hurt everyone. Anyone even looked at me wrong, and I just turned into this maniac, and that went on till well, this is right up to two, the year two thousand, which was a long time, and I was thirty. Jeez. I was 38 in the year 2000. That was from 14, 14 to 38. And there was a situation where <clears throat> I was groomed by old school doormen, like people like Lenny McLean, Ronnie Redruff. Like there were no licensing. They were all boxers. They all came from a, like, a proper gangster's background. And they had this saying, when it comes on top, I don't know if you know what comes on top means. No. It, it, what, it's a saying and he's like it's coming on top right? it means we, we, it's, we're going to have it we're going to fight we're going to fight now it's coming on top which means it's about to go go off yeah does that make yeah, sense yeah perfect sense yeah 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 so when it comes on top they're saying they used to drum into me it was, it's better to be tried by 12 than carried by 6 so I was like in this situation I got into it with 5 guys they surrounded me so I was I was looking after a club in Essex for for some proper people, like I don't want to, I can't mention names, yeah. but like proper names, because you just don't. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, these five guys walked up to the door, and it was in the summer, and there's a big queue of people along, and they tried to walk straight in, and I went, hold on, hold on, fucking back up. And that the other doorman I was with went, Jacko, like they're with me, they're my mates, because they they call me Jacko because I was Jack the Lad, although my name was Paul, no one knew my name was Paul. Jacko, like they're with me. I went, right, well, Mickey, you know what? They go in, they're your responsibility. Oh, yeah, 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 no worries. They're my responsibility. Five minutes in there, I've got red lights going off all over the place. A red light on the bomb, it's a panic button. Back, the barman's pressed the button. Right, it's, yeah. pa it's a panic button. They're already causing problems. They're getting live fag butts and they're dropping them into girls' cleavages off a balcony. Oh, Jesus. And upstairs, in the private bar, is some proper serious people. It's, it's where the proper people drank. So if they got in there, it would have been all kind of murders. They wouldn't have got out alive. So I've, I've got hold of them, and I, I've looked around for my backup, and my, my backup's fucked off because he don't want to get involved because they're his mates. So I've gone to them like, outside. I, I've, so I've, it, it was a club's like that, right? Everyone's packed. If it kicks off in a packed club, innocent people get hurt, like glasses, I knew I had to get them outside because if it kicked off, like girls were going to get hurt. So I just went to them outside. To my surprise, they walked out with me, which was lovely. And then I knew there was a camera outside the front door. So as I took them to the right side of the door to get away from the camera, because I knew it was going to go, they, uh, they sort of, the, the, stock, the short stocky geezer went to head butt me in the face. But I'd already slipped inside and took him out. Like, took, but any long story I hurt two of them really badly but five of them attacked me now I got nicked on a section 18 and a section 20 which if you, is a GBH I don't know if you have this grievous bodily harm yeah. and GBH with intent which means I intended to do it the second one she carries 10 years now I was I was dating a policewoman at the time Anthea who's who Zoe Tapper plays in a movie and it sort of killed our relationship but it, it's, it's a lot more in depth than that 
I had to wait 18 months to go to a Crown Court. And I was training c- celebrities all over the world. I had to go to a magistrate's court to get lead, to get permission to leave the country every time I wanted to fly away. So I was leading like this double life where I'm this, well, like this angry man who wants to ki- keep killing people and where I'm having this successful personal training career where I'm training, I made the body video with Elle McPherson and, you know, where, where I'm like started like a lot of, big name celebrities wanted me to look after them, like bodyguard them and train them. And I was like, I was, it was like, which way is it going to go? You know, which yeah. way is it going to go? I'm going one way or the other. And then I always, I always remember I was in San Francisco with my pal Ian and he went to me, let's go and see Alcatraz. And I went to him, are you having a fucking laugh? I'm looking at, I'm looking at a 10 stretch when I get home. <laughs> Let's go and view a prison. Yeah, that's a fucking good idea, isn't it? <laughs> fucking Alcatraz. I'm like, you're having a laugh, ain't you? <laughs> and, uh, I'm the only geezer I know who can beat two people up on a virgin flight to Florida and get away with it. No way. What um, happened? <laughs> post, just before 9-11, thank God it was just before 9-11, that fella you met earlier... He's a director, like he's a posh fella, right? It's not like me, he's, he's the opposite. People don't understand how we're mates, but sometimes you just are. <laughs> we're, on the, we're on a plane to, to Disneyland, me and him, we're going to Florida, plane full of kids, and Virgin give free alcohol all the way over there. These two fellas got on, and they were opposite us, and this big blonde geezer, long hair, he's stocking, like we're gangsters, South London gangsters, yeah, we're this, we're that, like, yeah, all right, mate. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've opened up the overhead compartment got Ian's bag and thrown it up the aisle and put theirs in what Whoa. so I've looked, like, how does this... <laughs> so I've looked at my mate right and my mate normally fast first class he went I'm telling you now you're not kicking off right <laughs> so he moved me into the middle and he sat on the aisle seat anyway they clocked me in. look at that prick with the muscles I mean, I was bigger then. I was on the door. And, it, and I've gone, oh, I'm not going to be able to take this. I'm not going <laughs> So uh, he's going to me. He's gone to the steward. Can you, stewardess, can you stop giving them free alcohol? They're getting more and more pissed, more and more leery. And she's gone, well, it's free flight. And it, can you move us? My friend's a bit volatile. We really need to move us. I'm telling you now, we can't move it. It's a packed plane. So anyway, a bit of ice hit me in the back of the head. Dink, bounced off my head. So I looked over and these two geezers are going. Oh. So then I looked at the clock and there's five hours left on the plane. Oh, Jesus. So then I was like, okay, fair enough. So I leant over and I used to say this thing to this. Everyone who worked with me knew this was my last sentence before. This was their last chance before. <laughs> so I leant over and went to these geezers. Do I look like some kind of cunt to you? <laughs> and they both went. Yes, you oh. do. Come on. Yes, you do. They went, come over here, and we're going to cut your throat. So with that, I leapt over my mate, and as I landed, I punched the first one around the back of the head, and he turned his head, his ear ripped half off, because he turned his head. Blood all up the thing, there's women screaming. <laughs> kids. And I knew I had to get the big lump before he got out of his chair, so I just went, bang, 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 and he's like, all like that, down in his chair. And I sparked them both out, and I'll give it to them properly. So the stewards, right, are really clever, right? Stewards are really, I, I was so impressed with this. One of because I'm still in the aisle, stamping on one and punching the other one, like proper giving it to them, like there's blood everywhere, right? One geezer grabs you, and then there's four or five of them, and they all push down the aisle, so you have to go. It's really clever the way they did it. So then they, I said, look, I'm not going to resist, that's fine, you know, I've done my bit now. They put me in plastic handcuffs, and then they're now diverting the plane to Canada, and I'm getting nicked, right? Yeah. Lucky enough, lucky enough, this was a this was before 9/11, right? Just before. Anyway, all the parents and some big black geezer with a little kid come up and went, "Hold on, it weren't him, it was them, and it's your fault because you let them get pissed and they were being abusive." So now they're going, "All right," and they they caught me out of handcuffs and I, like everyone around there spoke up for me. They wow. moved they moved us to another part of the plane, and uh, this bird fell asleep in Ian's lap. <laughs> With our head in his lap, and I'm going, get, get to give you a blowjob. He's going, I'm never flying with you ever again. I, I normally fly first class. This is disgusting. 
<laughs> so he's, he's getting out his first black card going to him, this is disgusting. I'm going to have all your jobs. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, oh, this is what happens in the economy class. <laughs> yeah, but the funny thing was, right, now these big South London gangsters, they're like, this not won't look at me. So he said to me, can you hang back? So I said, yeah, I don't want no trouble. We hang back. I think, I'm getting nicked. I'm going straight home, right? So we're going through uh, security at... at um, uh, where did we go? Florida. These two geezers of sort of, they don't want to know now, their body language is fucking hell. We picked on the wrong one here. <laughs> so they, walk, they walked away and I'm, I'm just, I'm like, I just want to go, I just want to, you know, go to Disneyland. <laughs> 35 yeah. years old or whatever it was. Right? So, so we get there and, they, and I'm thinking, uh, and, and then this guy at security went, he just winked at me when I have a lovely stay, right? And he just let me through. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's all good. We see them. It's big commotion. There's like security all around them. Bang, on top of the Wow. Nicked them all. And they were on the next plane straight out. And they were pissed. And they were picking up the hire car. Oh. <laughs> wow, so, just to say. I'm the only fellow I know that got, could get away with that. But I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't have got away with it a few weeks later with what happened you know yeah 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 things yeah. got tightened up after that that's for sure yeah yeah so, but, so yeah so go on, so, go on. so 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 i just want to i mean look i know it's such an emotional thing for you to talk about um but just yeah. if you don't mind i just i just want to ask like a couple more questions about you know the homes um yeah you mentioned that there were these like squads like like right rape, rape squads yeah. and yeah these were obviously older just guys or was it girls too and were they raping obviously both guys and girls like what was the arrangement no, the, the female staff used to have sex with the young lads in there but i think the young lads were fine with that i don't think there was a problem with that my brother used to shag some of the some of the female staff the rape squads were ma male dominated and this is when i first went there so we were like they used to go to the young kids dorm not the old kids dorm because their preference was young kids right so so what are we talking here young kids we're talking kids from as young as five in my experience but i know liam was young as three jesus i was i was my eighth birthday was not my eighth birthday present was not getting raped you know so i was so lucky that i managed to get away that first night um this is why people like liam they didn't have a chance because he was a toddler you know he had no chance they just they had absolutely i don't know it's just there was he was never gonna he was just never gonna have a life he was never gonna be able to survive that yeah that's that's you know it's one of those things where when you grow up in a care system, you, you have no sense of identity. So you have no sense of who you are because we identify with our family and who we are and like, you know, our culture and our environment. Like in a children's home, you don't have any of that. And also you don't have an education. I was illiterate to my mid twenties. You don't have a sense of identity. You don't have any self-esteem, self-worth. So then imagine on top of that, being raped regularly from yeah. as young from as young as three, four, five years old. Imagine that. It, it, it's unbearable. It's unbearable to even think of. You know. Imagine how 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 do you deal with that? Uh, and, and and the problem with the media today is they will not report it. They will not talk about it. They will not. Oh, they, they crack the door and then they just won't open it. They just won't open the door because when they, they know when they open the door that it's just it's just too vast. Right. I mean, you must get so you must. I mean, besides being so sad about it, you know, reminiscing, you must get so angry with the 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 way <laughs> it doesn't get resolved and stuff, and no one gets done for it. Really, it's it the, the problem with paedophilia and, and and with child abuse is it's it's multi-layered you know and it, and there's so it, there's so many different types and there's so many different in i work with uh francis lord listerwell he's cross-party chairman for child protection i'm one of his advisors and children in care are supposed to be better protected now 
But unfortunately, paedophiles find a way, you know, they, they find a way. These are people that are very inadequate in themselves. They couldn't have a normal adult relationship with somebody. They, they're very, they're predators. And, and I can spot them. I go into children's homes now and, and I advise people who work in the care system what to look for and how to whistleblow. You know, I mean, it's 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 a really it's such a vast subject. The problem with the uh, independent inquiry to child sexual abuse, it, it, historical abuse in this country, where I'm a witness, the core participant witness, is it's such a vast thing. It's taking it's going to take 10, 15, 20 years and cost fucking millions and millions of pounds, and it's not dealing with anything. Yeah, it's it's not dealing with it any. It's not it's not criminal. It's not. It's just a a box ticking exercise. You know. It's not. It's a, it, it, their whole uh, remit is to learn and to not let, allow it to happen. It's happening now. It's happening every day. Yeah. Kids are being kids are being groomed online every day. The people, and that's the thing. People think this has gone away. It's not gone away. There, there's more access to paedophiles now than when I was a kid. You know, it's it's something that needs to be. You know, I've had television companies ask me to do TV series on this stuff and. It's a tough thing because most people don't want to talk about it. And if you talk about what really goes on, you're, you're seen as a conspiracy theorist or some kind of nut job. So the credibility thing is really important. And because people in power are guilty of these things, they will try to discredit you. Not everyone in power is the paedophile. Yeah. But, but, you know, there's a lot of people that there are people in power who are. And they are more powerful than I am. And they're more powerful, you know. But thank God for the internet. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you bet. But now, now, Paul, like, just going back to kind of what Gareth touched on there with the anger and that. And look, yeah. I mean, I, I can only just sort of begin to try and understand how you must feel. But um, as far as I understand, Bill, it's Stanley, right? Uh, Starling. Starling, yeah. Starling, Starling. yeah. He, he, he got... 14. 14 years yeah and that to me for like multiple rapes beatings years of abuse number one first of all doesn't sound like much no. and number two there's three questions here number two how, how do you think they should deal with someone like that and number three what are your feelings to, towards him now let me give you a little bit more background okay so there was a case called operation mapperton where the police knocked on my door, and, the, and I, I never used to let the old bill in, but there was two white salts, you know what a salt is, like pretty yeah. police women knocking on my door. And when the old bill used to come for me, they used to come mob-handed. And I thought, why are they knocking on my door? And I just got off that GBH. And the old bill used to surround my house, and they'd come armed. Jeez. And I'd be, and I had, they would not come, because they were frightened of me. <laughs> <laughs> They would come proper tooled up and like right squads, you know, they would not fuck about with me. And I knew these old bit were knocking on my door, these two women. And I thought, they're old Bill, but they ain't going to come for me like this. So I ventured out the door and they went, Paul Connolly, previous of St. Leonard's Children's Home, can we please come in and talk to you? We have a, uh, we're, in, we're investigating a series of rapes in your children's home. Now I'm 36 years old, right? I, I'm like, just got off. I just swerved a 10 stretch in prison. The old Bill are not my friends, right? And they try to fit me up for a few other things, but let's not go down that road. <laughs> uh, so I let them in and they, and they said, can you sit down because we've got some bad news? And I said, well, what's going on? They went, well, this Operation Mapperton, we're investigating years of abuse from Bill Stalin, Alan Prescott, Hayden Davis, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, yeah, you're a bit fucking late now, mate. You know what I mean? You're a bit late now. We're talking about... 16 years or 17, 18 years later. So they said, right. And then they told me, so-and-so's dead, so-and-so's dead. They just reeled off six names of dead kids, and that, which has prompted the investigation. And then they told me Liam's dead, you know. And I was floored because he was there for me. And then when, I, when, I, when he needed me, I wasn't there for him, you know. And... uh so I went after them myself. I went after so hold on, I missed a bit. Okay, so they went to the old Bailey. Bill Starling got fourteen years for up to seventy victims. 
Mm. He's being investigated again now. He's out now. He's been investigating. He's been investigating another string of offences at other children's homes with him. For him now, and he's in his. I don't know how old he is. He's got to be in his eighties or whatever. And uh, Prescott and Davis walked away with time served, eighteen years, right? Eight. Sorry, eighteen months, not eighteen years. Eighteen months served. So I was. This is this is this is the tough bit, right? So now I've got this wonderful life which I potentially can see in front of me, and everyone's dead, and no one else is going to do anything about it. So I'm in a position to do something about it. So I, so I go and get me brownies, man gun, and I follow Prescott and Davis for nearly a week. I know what booze they're drinking in at lunch times. Not only did Prescott walk away with 18 months served, and Davis vital video evidence, vital video evidence went missing. And the judge said they couldn't be tried correctly or safely, right? This geezer was a GP, right? He was a, a magistrate. He was a counsellor. He was well connected. The evidence went missing because they fucking nicked it, right? This is what I'm saying, right? But when you say shit like this, people think you're mad. This can't be. This can't happen. But it did happen. So it was left to me to, to kill these two cunts, right? So that's what I was going to do. So. I followed them for about a week and I went in a boozer to kill them and I didn't kill them, I shit myself and I, I dropped the gun and I threw it, I threw it, I bottled it to be fair and uh, then I come home and stuck the gun in my own mouth, decided that I wasn't worth living and I didn't, I didn't kill myself, obviously I didn't kill myself, um, it's all in the movie, I, I can't explain it very well because I'll start crying and embarrass myself, you know, but um, Alan Prescott, when he come out of prison, was re-employed by London Borough Tower Emmys and promoted to the second but top job in the whole of, in the whole of the borough, a convicted paedophile. We've, we've been trying to get those documents from London Borough Tower Emmys forever and they won't give the documents up and they've probably been long shredded. Um, so he was promoted. I, uh, this was, the, when I was struggling to whether I was going to kill these people or whether I was going to have a nice life, Ian, that fellow you met earlier, paid for me to go to a shrink to try and sort this out because I was just got off a tent stretch. And I was sitting at this, at this do you know what I mean, shrink locker? Yeah, yeah. So, so I always had the gun stuck down the back of my trousers and I was sitting in this, thing having all this therapy and he was telling me he gave me this movie sleepers and he said Paul you're not you're not a violent man which was laughable what he was saying to him and the gun kept sticking in my back so I took it out and put it on his desk and he's like this is a this is a posh geezer right and he'd never seen a gun in his life and he's and I said don't worry the safety's on I said keep sticking in my back he said oh, God, I, need, I, I don't know what to do I need to phone the police I said well if you phone the police then why am I even fucking sitting here? Do you know what I mean? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm on the fucking, cr what do I do? You know, yeah. I need to kill these cunts. Yeah. You know, what do I do? And this, I mean, the movie scenes show it better. They, they show, I walked into the pub in East London and I, and, I, and I stood with my back to Prescott and Davis and there was a girl in the corner, like weird, just, just this young girl on her own. And she made eye contact with me, and she was mad, and like, don't, don't do it. This is before I even took the fucking gun out. Right? Honestly, people think this is nonsense. Two or three times in my life, people just appear, and then they're not there. I know, I know it sounds weird. No, I know. it doesn't. Okay, so I had it with a black priest once when I was dying, gave him my last rites, and nobody knew. And the hospital said there was no black priest ever in the hospital, but he was there. I have a weird shit happen to me all the time. I can't explain it. So I walked in the pub and I back, took the brown out of the back, cocked it, safety off, pulled it round to do Prescott in the back of the head. And as I did that, this girl just appeared in front of me and she was like crying and she was like, don't do it, don't do it. And then it's just enough for me to just fucking run out of the pub. Wow. I ran out of the pub. And it, it's portrayed better in the movie. I can't explain it very well. You're explaining it out, well, but don't worry, it's good. When I ran out of the pub, the girl weren't there. Wow. She weren't there. There were no one there. And, and uh, like, then I, like, oh, I've got these posh clients around here and I go to these 
dinner parties and I tell these stories. And, they, and one guy said to me, Paul, you, you can get your revenge, but, but write some books. He said, have a positive revenge. Go on, have a life. Your revenge is, mm. is living a life. But, you know, I still feel I let them down. I should have killed them. Should have killed them. But I still feel I let them down, you know, because nobody else was going to do it. And they're still around and they're still breathing. And that's my fault, you know. Wow. I, have to, I have to live with that. Wow. I, I think it's... I, I, I mean, I, you know, I can never say what the right answer is or isn't, but that's, you know, it, it, it's really interesting just about that girl who appeared and, you know, maybe, the, maybe there's more, maybe it like makes sense in like five, 10 years time. You know what I mean? You're like, when there is proper revenge, you know, like when, because like you said of the internet now and everything like that. And it's not like your story, you, to me, your story, I don't know why anyone would never think your story is not credible. Like, you know, you've written three books about it. You've got a movie. Like, there's going to be more and more people that probably come out because of what you're saying, you know, and they're going to be like, yes, it was these guys or, or we have it happening too now and nothing else is getting done about it. So maybe it's like not now, but like five, ten years time, it makes sense. Two or three times in my life, I did a TV interview for uh, the Gabby Logan show in London and Mylene Class interviewed me. I don't know if you know she is. She's a hot chick. She's yeah. nice. And uh, she, she read Against All Odds. And I walked into this TV studio. I've done a few. And uh, I, was, I was in the 80s and 90s. I used to be the fitness expert on most breakfast shows in, in England. I did the big breakfast. I did yeah, and all the BBC breakfast shows. They used to have me on as a fitness expert. So I was quite used to being on cameras. But this was a live interview. And I walked in. And uh, this... I know I was quite nervous and I sat down and there was this woman in the, in the audience and she just looked at me and she went, calm down. Right? So I'm like, all of a sudden I just like, whoa, that's nice. And I calmed down. And I did this good interview. So I went and thanked this bird again at the end of the interview and she wasn't there again. Wow. This, 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 this shit keeps... <laughs> and, and like when I was 49, I, I had, uh, uh, had um, 70% infection of endocarditis, which is a blood poisoning thing and 60% it's organ failure and death and they said to Joe and the kids come up say goodbye and all this and you know I, I, I seemed to get over these things I just seemed to get like I didn't die obviously but I had this black priest and he held my hand and he said to me do you mind if I talk to you I said yeah yeah I, you know I was in and out of consciousness and he was huge right and I've got small hands for a fella mm -hmm. and he put he put my hand in his hand and I was burning up, and he had these big, black, cold hands. And I've got an affinity with black people. I grew up with black people. I love black people. Right? I don't know why. I just feel connected because they were like my brothers when I was growing up. And he just comforted me, and he just said all these words, and I didn't know what they were, but I just felt like it doesn't matter what happens now. I'm all right. Survived next day. I was, in a, I was on a drip for five weeks in this hospital just because just like, my heart was under attack. Survived it. I started training in the stairwells about week two or three, week three. My friends were bringing in weights and packs for me to start training again. <laughs> I nearly killed myself again because I went backwards. <laughs> I went backwards uh, and I went in, almost went into a coma because I was training in the stairwells and I shouldn't have been. But, <clears throat> but for five weeks, I was saying, I want to thank this guy. And this guy don't exist. There's not a big black priest in this hospital. Wow. He was... He was here. He was there. He was, he was there for hours. You must know who he is. You, Paul, you were delirious. Wow. It is so what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about it? Like, what, what do you think that is? I don't know. I just, that, that shit happens to me all the time. I, I, don't, I can't explain it. You know, you can say, oh, you're the seventh son, the seventh son. You're meant to, people go, you're meant, to, uh, you're meant to be here to help people. See, I have to live with the guilt of the damage I've done. I've done a lot of damage in my life, right? But for the past, I don't know, 18, 19 years, I've done a lot of good. It's a bit like murderers in prison. They become born-again Christians because they're guilty. They feel guilty about what they did. I think it's slightly different for me. I do feel guilty about what I did, but I didn't hurt anyone who didn't have it come in. I, I, worked, I only hurt gangsters. I, didn't hurt, I wouldn't hurt an innocent person. I wasn't a bully, but you don't you don't do the shit I did. And stuff I've done that I can't even tell you because I go to prison. 
But you know, Paul, I mean, there, there's got to be something to be said for in your defense. Obviously, going through that, I mean, you know, people talk about nature versus nurture and stuff like that. If if you put someone in that environment, I almost, I, I can't imagine how you can't go through a rough patch in your life. You know what I mean? And, you know, Gosh. you mentioned spirituality. How do you deal with those demons nowadays? Do you, do you like meditate well, or pray or how, how do you deal with with some of that stuff now there's some stuff I might sound weird i'm going to say but i i did the reiki one and reiki two courses and i find it easy to help other people with reiki i find it easy to talk like i, I have lots of clients that come to me for physical problems i end up helping them with their mental stuff as well uh stuff you wouldn't believe i, like, I have people now that come to uh, it doesn't matter. I don't want to show off about what. No, but, tell us, but tell us. It's great. Uh, recent woman come to me. She, her last boyfriend ripped her off for forty-five grand. She's in the physical pain. A lot of people's physical pain is emotional and spiritual pain as well. And I do a lot of hands-on stuff, like obviously conventional sports massage and monofascial release, but also I do Reiki on them, and I talk to them, and I nurture them. And Reiki, you probably know, is just. It's just loving energy. Okay, it's just energy that comes from my loving soul into their loving soul. Universal energy, you know. It's just, and it really works. And I find that I can really help people. But with myself, it's harder. You know, it's hard to. It's harder for me to help myself. I often don't sleep nights. I haven't slept well. I don't. I haven't slept well recently. And I think it's just because when you've done the things I've done. You don't think you deserve good stuff. And there's too much good stuff happening to me. And I'm not comfortable with it. I'm not, I find it hard to accept it. Uh, because I've done some horrible things in my life, you know. And uh, I'm more comfortable with horrible than, than good stuff, if that makes sense. And so like, I've got... You know, a movie coming out of my life story. I've got the books. I've got, you know, a loving family. Uh, you know, a woman that stood by me for 17 years. And I don't feel worthy because, I don't know. I just feel that I've done too many horrible things to too many people. And... Maybe I just don't deserve this kind of life, you know. But you just crack on, and what makes me feel good is is helping other people. And it sounds sanctimonious, but I used to build my self esteem from being a womanizer, being a gangster, being a being a, a violent man, walking into a room and people being frightened of me. I now build my self esteem from helping people. Helping people with their physical and emotional and all their pain and giving people better qualities of life. And I can't believe how, how, how it's so much easier to help other people than it is to help myself, you know. It's, it's hard. I, 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 I'm damaged. And I, I will be damaged. I'll, I'll always be damaged. And nothing's going to change that. Nothing's going to change the fact that I'm a damaged individual. I know this is supposed to be positive, so No, 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 it's not at all, but no, no. I mean it's no, but I, I part just, of the gym. But it's I I I don't think um I don't think anyone has the right to judge you, if I'm honest, because mm. almost nobody understands whatever happened to you, right? And it's for me all I all I'm hearing from you is a beautiful story actually even though there's obviously bad things that you've done, I can, I can understand why you've done those bad things. And I just think, you know, there's, there's so much more to the story that's going to come. And I think you're doing an amazing job, buddy. And I think, uh, you know, maybe t just talking about it more to whoever guys like us on podcasts and whatever is, is part yeah. of that healing journey and, and acceptance, you know, like it's, it's all part of the journey, you know what I mean? Of who makes you and yeah. it's I, I, amazing. I, I, when I, when I do try to meditate and 
and do Reiki, I find it harder to do it for myself. And when I do it for other people, I have remarkable results. But <clears throat> I think that I don't think you grow up the way I did and just end up normal. You just no. don't. I mean, I mean, and the trouble is, what what I feel, I think where my guilt comes from is the people around me suffer because of me. You know, my family, people close to me suffer because it has a ripple effect. It does have a ripple effect. And, you know, people, my wife says, when you're nice, there's no one nicer. But when you go down, mm. you know, I know it's not supposed to be a negative thing, but human beings are, we're all fallible. Um, the way, uh, the trouble I'm having right now is there's so much good around me. I know that sounds weird. I, you know, I have a film producer, like, you know, the movie, I, is, I went and watched the movie the other day with my son. It's not quite finished. I went and watched the rough proof of the movie and with Harley, my eldest son. My, my youngest son couldn't watch it. And uh, he doesn't recognize that person. He doesn't know who that person is in the movie. It's like, Dad, you're a pussy. That's not you. You made this shit up. You made this shit up. <laughs> it's like, you're not, that's not you. And then he did say, now I know why you're a bit fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for him to sit there and watch that and to watch the child abuse stuff and to watch the gangster stuff and, and, and to, to get this, the, the movie's about when I was 11 and 12 and when I was 35, it's pick, pick, picks on those two, those two types, types of my life. And there's nothing around like it because people are frightened of this subject. There's nothing around like it, you know. And Michael Socher plays an amazing me. It, you know, there, there was a scene in I, I won't I won't spoil it, but it. But I used to look after prostitutes. Used to mind them like brothels. Yeah. And the scene it, when I watched this scene in a movie, I just couldn't believe it. It's just so real. It's like being back there. There was a gang of. Uh, African guys who were kicking the doors in at the brothels and raping the girls, beating them up and robbing them. So the powers that be got us in there to look after them. Sure enough, they turned up on my watch because that was, that was always going to happen. And uh, we ended up having to deal with them. And, uh, and, uh, and Michael played the scene so well. And, it, you know, I won't, I won't, I won't go into detail because I'm not allowed to talk about the movie too much. But it, it's just surreal watching it because I'm looking at this guy at 35 and I'm 56 and I, I don't recognise that guy now. I, I do and I don't, you know. It's strange. It's important what you said about Muhammad Ali, isn't it? Though? Like that makes yeah. so much sense. Yeah, I mean, it's too easy to be a victim, you know. It's too easy to sit back and go, poor me, poor me, poor me. Do you know what? I, I, what, what helped me was travelling when I traveled the world and I, and I saw real hardship and I saw this, this, this tiny little place, Essex, London, you know, I, I, I went to South America and where kids were shot in the back of the head and put in the back of lorries because they were messing up the streets and, you know, they didn't have a fucking chance, you know, like when you see the real hardship in the world, like people's, it, we are so privileged, you know what I mean? We're really privileged in the Western world. We're really privileged. So yeah, sure, I might have been dealt with shit, yeah, and, but do you know what? I think sometimes I feel like I'm helping so many people right now. But I don't want to sound like showing off, you know. It's just, it's tough. It's tough. I'm like, in my day to day job, I don't just help people physically, I help them mentally and spiritually as well. And I just, I, I'm more comfortable with bad and good. <clears throat> and the reason I'm not sleeping now, the reason I'm struggling now is because it's so good. It, mm. I wake, I don't know if you ever watched Oliver Twist, the movie Oliver yeah, Twist. Yeah, definitely. Right, so you remember the scene at the end where he wakes up to these white walled, beautiful streets and he's in paradise. Yeah. That's my life now. From where I come from, I wake up, I look out the window and I go like, that's what it's like for me every day. I'm in paradise, you know, compared to where I was. It's like that. It's like that. And then I feel, I don't deserve this. What about all the dead kids? What about all the people I grew up with? They were better people than me. 
what about Liam? Liam was a better person than me. You know, he was a he saved me so many times, and yet no one's here, none of them are here. They're all dead. You know, why why do I deserve to go on and they don't? Why? There's nothing special about me. Sure. I don't. I think there, I think there's cool. a there's a lot special about you, bud. And yeah, yeah. It's uh, I'm just out of interest. Have you like have you ever you know sought help by you know anybody and spoke to, spoke to them about it? Has that been part of your journey? Yeah, I've I've seen more shrinks than you would believe, and and you know I have seen lots of people, and I've spoke to lots of people, and I I just don't believe. I don't believe. I think the only person that can help me is me. I, I know the problems, and I know, and I know how to, I know how to, to deal with my subconscious talking, and you know, I know how to talk to myself properly, internally, and I have to, I have to straighten myself up. I, I, I think that I know. I've read so much about these subjects. I've seen dozens of shrinks, spiritualists, you know, you know, I, I used to seek that stuff out all the time. And now I just know that the best per- person to talk to me is me. To, to, you know, you know, that internal voice, that subconscious voice needs to be put straightened up sometimes, needs to be told to shut the fuck up. You know, my logical mind will always win. I know they say your subconscious is stronger, but no, it's not if you don't want it to be. You know, it, the the only person that can straighten me up is me, and and I can and I will and I do, you know. But we we all go like this. I'm not bipolar or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you were trying to get this really uh, positive interview, and you've got got. No. This sh- but it's no, one of the, the most amazing chats I've ever had. Everyone has an ebb and flow. Like I was listening to someone today who's. Who struggles with depression, but he's actually a, like a motivational speaker, and yeah. you know, and he says nowadays there's just a certain way of being able to know. It's almost like a cold. Like he, he sees it like a cold. He's like, oh, I'm getting a cold. It's his depression. He can relativize it better. He'll come back out of that that yeah. place. But he, like you were saying, he has to work it through. It has to come from within, and and you get to know yourself, and that's kind of like what you what you're saying as well. Yeah. What do you all? Process- Sorry, okay. It's processing the positives. It's like, you know, I, I know who I am and I know what I need to do and, it's, and I know how to do it. And, and it's just processing the positives. It's like, I, you know, I, I just understand myself very well. And, I, and I, self-pity is, and anger are two most destructive things, you know. And, and you know, a bird will, f- will fall from a tree frozen to death, hit the floor stone dead without an ounce of self-pity. That's a human trait, self-pity, and it gets us nowhere. And anger, anger gets you nowhere. Anger eats you up, you know. It, it, neither of those things can help me. And, and, and I know and, and I know how to talk to myself. And I, you know, I was going to say something, but I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry, you were going to ask me a question. Yeah. What well, I was just going to say, what are your thoughts on forgiveness? I don't think you can forgive people that are not sorry, but I feel you have to forgive. Uh, I feel you have to detach. I mean, the people that abuse me are not sorry. They'll never be sorry. You know, they're, they're still doing it. I got contacted by a young lad in his uh, late 20s recently that Stalin had abused on his last lot before he went to prison in another children's home. So, you know... It's all right saying turn the other cheek, I forgive you, and all that stuff. These people are, are not sorry. I, I ain't going to forgive someone that's not sorry. But you know what? I'm not going to let them have a place in me where I'm angry enough for them to to bob to to affect my life. It doesn't affect my life at all. I don't think about these people on a daily basis. I don't. They don't. They don't enter my mind. What I think about, what I deal with, my demons are that man I was. How the hell could I possibly have done some of them things? You know, mm. and am I still capable of doing that kind of stuff? Because that concerns me more than anything. Because at the end of the day, you can do all this self-help and you can do all this spiritual stuff. If you've still got that anger or that aggression inside you and it could still come out, that's not a good thing. You know, and 
I don't feel like I, I could be that man again. But hard drive is hard, you know, you know, something that's hard driven into you. It's very hard to change, I think. But I'm getting better at it. I, I, I'm getting better at it all the time. I would, I've got a very high, I think, EQ. I think I've got, I'm emotionally intelligent. And I'm also love people and people love me. And that's what saved me. The fact that I was lovable and likable. People took pity on me. People tried to help me. And I was very intelligent emotionally. I, was, I knew how to get the best out of people. That's why I'm still here. You know, and I need to go back to my strengths. I need to understand who I am. I need to, I don't know, I just, I just hate self-pity. I hate anger. I hate people feeling sorry for themselves. When people come to me, if they've got self-pity, I just say, look, I can't help you. You know, stop, get rid of the self-pity. That's not going to help you. It's not, it's not going to make any difference. You know, that needs to go. You, you know, I, I think emotional intelligence is really important and loving people. I love helping people. I love, I make a difference in people's lives now and it really does help me. It helps me then. You know, I come in and I, I can do 10, 12 clients a day. I'm rammed and, you know, I've picked texts and phone calls from people all the time saying, I've slept through the first night without drugs or alcohol. What have you done? It's amazing. You know, and I just, and I say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I have to say, like when earlier on, you, you, I mean, you don't, you look no a, a day, not a day older than forty, but like it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's what, crazy. <laughs> I'm looking at you and Gareth, and I'm thinking, yes, I'm not sure who's the older one. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's bring you uh, to the equation, but, <laughs> no, but I can only see you two, so I mean, I'm out of this one. <laughs> oh, classic. So, so Paul, yeah. sorry, we, uh, we won't keep you, you too much longer, but I just want to ask a couple of things. Um. There was obviously a couple of like turning points, I guess, in your life. Like, so, well, one you, you mentioned is in you were kind of illiterate and that was 25 when you learned to read and write. And then what was the sort of turning point from the violence to the nonviolence? Um, the first time I dated Joe, I dragged a, car, a guy out of his car. And uh, when I went back to the car, she was my car. She was hyperventilating into a paper bag. And she just said to me, do you know what? If you want to date me, this stops now. And Joe taught me right from wrong. I've been with Joe since it's come up 17 years. And although it's very late, she taught me, she gave me a moral, I always had a moral compass, but she just said to me, that's unacceptable. You just don't behave that way. You know, you just, and she was almost like, she just, I admire her the way that she knows she's just got this real sense of what's right and wrong and she's instilled it in me as well so there was that there was a turning point where i was predicted to go to prison and the jury found me not guilty self-defense reasonable false and i was told from seven eight years old every day that i'd end up in prison and i didn't and that was a massive turning point uh, and the guy you met earlier, Ian, has helped me a lot over the years. He's uh, he's helped me a lot. But it's just these people like like my wife and and the kids and and I think you naturally evolve as well. But I think it's just taken me a long time. You know, I mean, I was nearly forty years old. I had no wife or no kids, and I was and I never thought I was going to have children because mm. because of my background. But you know, at forty, you think well. That's done for me. I met Jo, she's 25, and she told me otherwise. She just said, you know what, you are, she, she just believes in me. She you are a good man. You know, you, you're, not, you're not a bad man at all. You, you, you're a good man. You know, it's, it's just having people who love you and believe in you and who want to support you. And, and she's had so much shit from me over the years. I don't know how she's still here, to be quite honest with you. You know, and Paul, um, you spoke about your kids. I mean, you what a gift and what a, I mean, how do you, I mean, you must really treasure them in a sort of a special way and be so protective over them. I am, yeah. And I, you know, I go into their dorm, into their dormitories, into their bedrooms, <laughs> and uh, you know, Harley's got, he's got, they got lovely bedrooms, nice desks, nice lamps, Xboxes, big smart TVs, and. I, 
And I just look and think, you know, we've done that. We've given them a nice life, you know. We, they, they're in a lovely home, in a nice area, in good schools. You know, they've got lots of friends. They have just a lovely life. And it's just wonderful. And, again, that's not really down to me. That's down to their mum. She's just she's so hardworking and she's somebody who just holds it all together, to be fair. That's not – I just – it's easy to earn the money. That's the easy bit, isn't it? Yeah. You know? I mean, and it's just, they're just such lucky kids and she balances it, you know, with all my shit, she just comes in and says like, stop being a dickhead and, you know, she straightens me up, you know, so it's amazing. again, I can't take any credit for any of that. <laughs> I think earning the money is the easy thing. You can go out and earn money. I mean, I've... I, I, I don't think I've been the, the most amazing male role model for my boys. I, I think that I have been in more recent years. Um, but I think Jo's been just so consistent and she, she hasn't worked because she wanted to make sure that they had that security and that loving family to come home to. And, and I think it really pays off. They're just two really well-balanced kids, you know. They're really, you know, and again... It's more down to her than me, far more. Which is most of the cases in most families, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, I think you should you should definitely take some credit there as well because you you were humble enough to make changes when when you had the voice of reason. You know, some people don't. You know, so there's something to be said for that. And I also think it's really special. You know, that some, that somewhere along the line. You became the person that ch- broke a cycle, perhaps you know. And yeah, it's like it's massive. Yeah, and I and I think that's the, uh, the only reason that Joe jo stuck with me is because when I've fucked up and God have I fucked up, she's just turned around and went, Do you know what? You're this, you're that, you're this, you're that, and you don't behave because of that because you are that. You're not that stupid little boy in the children's anyway. And you're and she'll give it to me both barrels, load the gun, bang bang. I'll go away, sulk, think, come back, tell her she's right because she was most of the time. And then I try and change again and I try and evolve and I'll listen. Whereas, you know, someone's right, they're right. If you're, you know, if you're in the wrong, you need to hold your hands up and try. And, you need yeah. to try and change. We're all fallible, but if you don't try, you need to try and change. You need to evolve. You know, you need, you need, you need to have the, enough emotional intelligence to understand when you're wrong and admit you're wrong and and then look at it in detail and say what did I do there why did I do that I've got to stop that I've got to do this instead you know so I think you just need to have that that inner understanding of who you are and if you have fucked up you fucked up and you've got to put it right you know we you you've got to try and put it right sure wow. yeah but what an amazing chat, man! Seriously, thanks so Sorry, much. Sorry, I, I feel like it was a little bit negative. In no, places. but but it wasn't at all. But it's like we like uh-huh. exactly what we said like before we started chatting. It's it's the story which counts. Yeah. It's the story which has the value, and I yeah. think you've brought so much value. It's actually incredible. But um, I I know it's going to be a, a, you know like a great listen. So thank you so much, man. Um, but 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 just before we finish off, like. If people say, do you want to get hold of you? Uh, do you want to support you in some way? All the charities, uh, can you just sort of give us those details? We write a lot of notes and we put it all on our website and everything. Yeah. So, Yeah, I mean, if people want to get hold of me, the easiest way is they could just, like, obviously, um, my email address is probably the easiest. Um, paul at paulconnolly.com. Yeah. Um, and the charity that I support now mostly in Essex is that one there. That's their logo. That's, that's a uh, kids inspire. Okay. And, and the reason that I do a lot of work with them is because the, the, like most of their people only get paid for three days a week and work six okay. and they're very committed to, uh, t- and there's a massive hole in, ch- in like this kind of su- mental support for children and, and nobody's doing it apart from them and they're not getting any help from the government. And we're so reliant on, on you know, just private, uh, you know, not just money, but, you know, help. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, 
and that, that the reason what attracted me to them is Sue Bell, their their, their founder. She's a she's a Reiki coach, and she's a, she everything's done holistically and spiritually with the children as well as using the normal therapies. And it's just they're just amazed in what they do with kids, and they get them early, you know. Mm. They get and they work with the parents where they can. So yeah, I mean that's that's the charity that I'm mainly working with now. Awesome, man. Cool, man. Well, I just want to, I just want to say thank you, like, um, on you know my behalf, like, what an amazing chat. But I think I think you're an incredible human. Seriously, like, uh, I I can never ever imagine like what you have gone through, and um, I just sort of commend you for being such a a great guy. Like, you still you still telling a story and you've actually got a smile on your face and even though that you're you're of course super emotional you know there's a positive side of you you know like that you you're sort of spreading and you're wanting to make this change and you're wanting to find stuff out um that other people dare not but and the, the, the important part for me is that it takes people like you uh, to make these changes you know what i mean sometimes you feel like you're running against the tide um, yeah but it's people like you that make this change you know what i mean and, and the world needs guys like you and maybe you know you talk about all these other guys and girls that were in your life before who maybe not be here now maybe you the guy that was the strongest that is able to carry this message and to make the change um and wow you've i mean you've touched my heart in this message mm -hmm. and uh in this chat sorry and I just uh, I can't wait to first of all go read your book, see how I can help you out, yeah. and, and just um, it's been a, it's been a really beautiful chat. But I mean, you you totally just opened up to us, you know what I mean? From you know being this hardcore guy to now just a guy who doesn't seem like that at all, you know what I mean? It's it's really great to see. So I appreciate everything we both do. You know, it's been an amazing chat. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gareth. Thanks, Craig. It's been great talking to you. Sorry, you know, if there was some negative points there. I know, I, I, it's just obviously, it's just, you know, I, I think if it had spoke to me a couple of months ago, it might have been a very different interview. But you know, I'm. Uh, there's a lot of things coming together right now, which it obviously takes its strain as well. But you know, I hope it was positive enough for you. Definitely. Yeah, Paul. Cool. Just from my side, briefly. I mean, the struggle is is what is sort of identifiable with everybody. Obviously, the details of your struggle are go very deep and are pretty insane. However, there's something that everybody in their life struggles with and to different degrees. Yeah. And so, so when you say it's negative or it's positive, I mean, it's just it is what it is. And, and you've gone through this and you are going through it. And that's the other thing that people – can really latch on to on this and go, you know, there are other people struggling out there too. We're all in this together. We can help each other. Mm. Let's listen. Let's talk about it. Let's have an open conversation. And like yeah. Gareth said, you know, we're just so grateful for that because, I mean, our hearts have been touched with your story. But when I go back into my life tomorrow, I can I can be like, you know, once again, relativize things, you know. And, and have a new sort of thought on a uh, way of looking at my life. So mm -hmm. that's why this is so important to do. So just from, uh, once again, just from my side, but obviously from both of us, just thank you so much for sharing this and keep doing what you're doing. And obviously give us the details of your movie uh, as well. I don't think you mm -hmm. mentioned the full details of that. Oh, it, uh, I mean, if you look up sixfrom8.com, uh, that's the website, but that's just got the short movie on there. Because uh, the feature film is uh, is actually just in the last couple of weeks of the edit now, so awesome. yes. Yeah, so when can we expect that? Well, we we're, we're talking to people like Netflix and Lionsgate and all of these people at the moment. So right. uh, that, that's all up in the air at the moment because that's the business right. side of things, which is yes. actually not my it takes some time. Yeah, yeah, it, but it's. It, it, hopefully we're look, looking towards the end of this year autumn release but i mean it's such a powerful movie it's just unbelievable it's really so exciting that it's coming out but the, the website is six from com, so people can check that out quite easily yeah beautiful thank awesome, you buddy. thank you so much man Jeez. thanks wow, guys man. Was, yes but uh, my, my hands have actually been sweating the whole chat yeah me it too was just i was like, just thinking that i was like it was yeah. i was on the edge of my seat i was but i was like 
it's sorry great. i do go, i do go off all over the place no well. worries man it's that's that's kind of great storytelling anyway just, you you kept just a everyone thing before clued. we finish and you know, before i forget paul um just from a personal note I, i'm a chiropractor and i and i t- i see myself as a healer as well yeah um I'm dealing with people with all sorts of things and and I'm just grateful for you you've you've helped me see something about myself today like all the some of the tough things in my life that I've experienced I'm able to it's it's catharsis for me to go to work and to help someone else yeah. and and um and I'd never really seen that before so so thank you for from a personal ah. side as well thank you for, uh, ah, for helping great. me see that in my work. so yeah it's really cool man Connected with you there. Thank you. So. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll 